Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to a Shadow Channel podcast. My name is Lewis Hamilton, and today I'm joined by a good friend of mine, uh, Doug Fender. All right. Doug, how are you? I'm all right. Now, for those of you who don't know, Doug is a film director slash producer slash writer. Uh, I think jack of all trades is what you... How you described it, right? Uh, student of the game is what I, I'd say. Man of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so many people try to train themselves in one area. People want to be directors, cinematographers, whatever... I like to dip my toe in sort of every single part of it. I like to be involved in the full creative process. So, I, yeah, I'd say I'm a, sh- a student of the game. I, you know, if you'd asked me two years ago, I would have said, I want to go directly down the radio path. I want to go specifically for that for that end, right? That particular light at the end of that particular tunnel. But I agree completely with what you're saying, um, and I, I feel the same way now, where you want to make your base as broad as possible because if it's too narrow it's unstable right and you want to you want to know all this other stuff and and it's part of of, of drinking in the art form and that's something that definitely yeah you, you uh, take sometimes seriously. not even just knowing it i mean as long as you can understand it because uh, as a director if you're wanting if you've got a vision if you've got a clear vision you've got to understand what the person that you're trying to convey the information to is going to have to do so I, I can't just say to somebody, oh, light him so that it looks like this. You've you've got to talk him through it so that he, he knows exactly what you mean, which is kind of hard to do if you don't have a mm. clue about his job. Exactly, yeah. I think it was, it was what was it? The, there's a Tarantino line where he said, where he said it was something to do with, when he first got into filmmaking, he, he, was, he was confused as to how the scale of something like making a feature-length film could even be pulled off in one of the producers. And I'm paraphrasing all of this. Uh, come up of to him course. and said, no, no, it's, it's about you coming up with the ideas and you correctly communicating what you want to us, the producers, and then we... That that's where the rest of that that kind of that that legwork takes place. Yeah, and yeah, that's so what you're saying. If you're liking someone, it's imperative that that person understands where that fits into the overall flow of the film to some extent, you know. But but also not to the extent where they get bogged down in the minutia of the of the chaos that's going in, on inside of the head of the person that's creating all this, you know. Yeah, well, uh, you've got to trust the people that you're working with. You've got to trust that they know what you're talking about. If as long as they trust you to communicate it to them in a correct way. Uh, you get a lot of people that are absolute control freaks and they just I, I'm a bit like that but I don't hire other people to do things for me I just do it myself so I'm hands on doing everything I, uh, that's involved in making the film but some people they become total slave drivers and just force them every, yeah. you, uh, you've got to trust them you've got to realise that although you know what you want this person probably understands it a lot more than you do mm-hmm. so he'll know what you're on about you just have to find a way to tell him yeah, I mean, it's all about kind of also parceling off response. I mean, it's kind of the Tolkien method sometimes when you're creating something where Tolkien would create an entire universe in his head and all the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit are are Tolkien taking small splices, tiny yeah. chapters in a history that he himself, in the Silmar- Silmarillion, it's the whole bloody history going back to lore that's just like this is how the Middle Earth or, or the, the universe that Middle Earth exists in was created you know and, and these are the gods and you're going back thousands of years he takes two little splices out of that and it's a little bit like that with, with uh, creativity I find I'm sure you're maybe the same you have a massive and what you're really doing is summarizing it and summarizing it and summarizing it and focusing it down yeah. until what you eventually end up with when uh, as you were saying the Chinese whispers or the Orient, Oriental mutterings if you prefer yeah, <laughs> micro- man- the micromanagement of your own film yeah. that's, 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 and oh. it's it summarized down and down and down uh, into a digestible form that individual members of the team you're working with can understand and, yeah. and, and, and slot that into the, you know, the, the way that they're, they're approaching it um, uh, when they're working on the show as well or the film as well or whatever. Right, yeah, abs- absolutely it's a, it's a collaborative effort it's a collaborative effort um, I, I mean I wish I could comment on it a lot more but so far I've not worked with crews I've just done stuff myself always <laughs> yeah i mean I, you i'd say you've you've not worked yeah you've not worked with large production crews but i mean you've worked with in some cases what five six seven people in the case of uh, uh definitely some of the christmas films that you've made and you've made what two christmas films uh, well that what you're seeing on screen mm. is five or seven people but behind the camera there's really, really only just me you. yeah yes. uh I, i'd i'd say yes yeah, seven would probably be the largest mm. and quick Chris, quick Christmas Carol and quick but wonderful life. You wrote those. Uh, me and Ross wrote them. Yes. Um, if you can say wrote them, I mean we're parodying 
yeah. something that already yeah. exists. In terms of the script and stuff, I mean, part of the script obviously is direct parody of what your what, what the, the original material was. But it, it, yeah, it we, we, we yeah. played a twist on the fact that Ross is a neurotic mm. comedian. We thought, oh, instead of Scrooge, mm. you could be a neurotic. You yeah. know, it was all done across the stretch of about five days. Um, what what we'd actually seen is there were people doing a Christmas advent calendar on YouTube. I don't know if you've heard of them. No. A Christmas advent calendar, meaning from the first day of Christmas all the way up until the 25th of December, these people were making sure that every single day up until Christmas they had a new video uploaded, a new like five-minute short film. So they started working on it from about October. Some of them were really good. Some of them were really bad. Then me and Ross watched them, and we thought, you know... It's five days until Christmas Eve. We could probably make a like try and get one film done by Christmas Eve, mm. and at the time, we it was we were just talking. We didn't actually think we were going to do it, but then we did. We just thought, you know what? What the hell? We have five. Let, let's let's go for it. We can at least get a short film out in five days, and then uh, Christmas Carol is what came along. I mean, looking back at it right now, it's fucking terrible. <laughs> but well, you know, I I still. I still love those films because, you know, they're... I mean, a Christmas film isn't the kind of thing you watch in June, right? So it's like, when Christmas rolls around, I usually will watch A Quick But Wonderful Life. I, I watched it last Christmas. You did? And, and uh, oh. the, the, this Christmas, it's just um, over. And the one... Because it came out, what, 2013-14? Um, yeah, we, we actually... Um, we announced it on your show. Yeah, if you we, remember yeah, that. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, you did. And you also you also talked about your your uh, blood donor blood donor parody ad that was uh, from American Psycho. Oh God, don't plug this stuff, man. <laughs> people people go back and watch it. I, I <laughs> thought it was pretty good. I mean, I, yeah, that was where I recognised Dez when I ran into him at the Hill Street Theatre last year. I said, "That's the guy from the because uh, he's the guy that gets killed, isn't he?" Or is he? The guy Dez gets killed in everything yeah, that I make. Basically, well, I don't uh, know if it's so much saying such and such gets killed it's usually Ross that's very keen to do the killing <laughs> it is you know? I, if, if it, it's not Ross that does the mm, killing he inadvertently causes it yeah I think I, I think is is it Louis Harper that it's, has a video of Ross running around uh, hills uh, and he's murdering people because they've this, got his bag it's, it's actually quite a scary this is called the mirrors yeah it's called the mirrors um Yes, Ross is doing his best. Uh, no country for old men. Yeah, uh, he's got the he's got the black teeth, and he's out choking people. Um, then reading poetry. I, I don't know if you noticed that um, none of the audio actually got recorded outside because of wind. I noticed that, yeah. and they recorded it all in a bedroom, so it's quite um, mm. it's quite uh, you've got a big yeah. Windy there were a few audio problems can... with a quick Christmas Carol, weren't there? <laughs> a few problems yeah. with a cr- quick well, Christmas Carol. You know, um, best, yeah. Of so. course, once again, we were outside and we accidentally record. Uh, we recorded over all of our audio from the outside, so we had to re-record them in the bedroom, and it's so obvious. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things, though. It's it's messing things up or having things not going as as planned becomes exciting. There's an extent to which it's exciting because when you run into it and you find the solution, you've all, you've in a way. Uh, it, with a kind of 3D printer in your mind, if your mind is somehow a 3D printer, yeah. uh, and, and you're crafting virtual tools, um, you're putting another tool in your toolbox, you, you're, you're learning something new. Yeah. And that's insanely rewarding. In a, in a weird masochistic way, you almost look forward to, not failure, but messing things up. You know, it's... it's I definitely enjoyed those films. It's I, I felt that the, 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 the Quick But Wonderful Life... There were elements of like Monty Python in there. Was that just me? The, the, the sky at the beginning and the conversation between the angels, I found quite. Well, have you seen It's a Wonderful Life? I, you know, I, I think I've seen about half of it. It's one of those films that I will usually come on uh, literally around Christmas, funnily enough, and I'll usually be drunk, or at right. least partially drunk, uh, because I only really <laughs> drink over the festive period. I mean, I drink when I go out, but I don't go, I don't, I don't tend to, to drink all that heavily. So over Christmas, I use it as an excuse to. To say I'm going to experiment with alcohol, so yeah, right. I would just—I usually be drunk and I'll watch Christmas films. I think I watched Thirty Days of Night, which ironically was on Christmas one year. Um, Is that a Christmas film? I don't know. I, don't I mean, know. It, it takes place in Alaska. There's definitely it's about snow vampires, there, but so. there's snow. There but. is snow, but there's usually snow in Alaska. So there's um, well, it, it wasn't Monty Monty Python esque. The actual mm. Wonderful Life film, the f- believe it or not. Um, it starts off with two stars in the sky talking to each other mm. and um, one star saying to the other star that you have to go again, down and yeah, it's help a Jimmy Stewart. Film so. with religious elements in it from the 1940s. 
It's, I believe so, the yeah. 40s, Frank 40s, Capra. If you look at 40s and 50s, and then you look at the swords, sword and sandals technical or epics of the 1950s, you know, uh, Ben-Hur right. and, uh, and and Jason and the Argonauts and all this kind of stuff. Jason and the Argonauts, by the way, trailblazers in terms of animation. Uh, oh, no, that, that, that part with the skeletons I could watch yeah. again and again and oh, again. Oh, yeah, and, and also, the, the, I think it's a Colossus. It's a massive moving iron guy. Uh, is that the one with the one eye? I think so, uh, yeah. Um, and uh, the Cyclops, that's it. Oh, the, the Cyclops, Cyclops yeah. Colossus, yeah. Uh, it, it's, those have a religious element, and maybe Monty Python in the 70s were actually taking influence from those films. Well, they based the, the whole yeah. film on yeah. religion. They would have been burned exactly. for that years Exactly, yeah. You ever seen that earlier? famous interview with John Cleese, and they're talking to John Cleese and Graham Chapman, and they're talking to the bishops? It's like 1981. You can get it on no, YouTube. No, I haven't seen this. And it's just called, I think the video was probably uploaded by an atheist, and it's like, John Cleese despises Christianity. And I'm like, well, you know, that's the default position for most religions. But it's like, uh, it's 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 a great video though because you, there's such a difference in the way that it was received by the establishment that you just would never see if you watched Question Time today. That these guys are livid that they have released this film, uh, clearly parodying the yeah. nativity story and, and and the life of Jesus. Um, but yeah, I mean, they def- definitely took influence from that. So maybe they took influence from those films in the 50s, being about 20 years afterwards, and you guys took f- influence from that, and maybe I connected the dots wrongly. Because at the beginning, I said, this is almost like something with... They have these weird graphics on, on Monty Python that, that still hold up, I think, where, where everything's just a picture, but they're having it fall. You know, yeah. the, the, the opening of Life of Brian, it's, it's all this really strange grotesque artwork that they have in the shape of like roman columns and stuff like that you know like the old classical columns but i don't think they have it in meaning of life as well which is i'd say the least popular of the three meaning of life uh the actors would agree yeah the i believe john cleese does not even care for it in the slightest i yeah. thought it was all right it's, i it's, thought it was funny is it, it was weak? more yeah, random it was more random it, it was more, was like, more a, like a feature length version of their tv show of their sketch show yeah 100 percent. So, so you did the christmas films and prior to prior to doing a quick uh christmas carol was that the longest film you had made up until that point uh yes it was it was also the first proper short film that i'd made with my uh dslr mm. uh, jumped into dslr filmmaking so it was a massive and i still use that camera today mm. uh, you've seen a wonderful life in open lines mm. the quality jump from that one camera is just crazy mm. and uh, it's still getting it's it's even getting better to this day so between a quick but wonderful life and open lines you got a new camera no, no open lines is the same camera it's that the made same a quick christmas carol on really the first one wow yeah and so that camera that so for those of you who don't know, Doug's been on the show before. You were on the show September 2013. We were during the Fringe back in yes. 2013. I think it was a couple, it was maybe a week after the Fringe had ended, you know, because uh, I think it was early September that it went up. Um, so I don't know, maybe if it was like August the 30th. Ah, uh, yeah, I was in the process of Ed and Ross's mm-hmm. small documentary. Yeah. I mean, and it feels like ages ago to me because I was starting my NC mm. at the time and I'm now coming to the end of the se- coming you know into the second semester of my HND for the first year so it's like it's quite a while ago and and you know um this conversation i think from my point of view would have been very difficult to have with you a year and a half ago from a from a even something approaching a technical standpoint because i just didn't know i just didn't know about this kind of stuff at all well neither did i mm. neither did i yeah. and it's it's a great thing about learning as you go as well um but it, it I, I we would not have been that's the interesting thing it's almost like with some art forms like someone could speak to you about fine art and if they and you might i don't know how much you know about fine art i don't know much about it but the strange thing about particular art forms and spheres of creativity is it's almost like a hidden language that one person will share with another person if they are both um like you'll have friends no doubt who also love making films and you will be able to speak to them about filmmaking in a way that you won't be able to speak to me or other people about filmmaking because there's a more experience driven that you've both shared those um, two, partially two those i will dispute that uh, briefly mm-hmm. yeah. everyone that i know that i talk to about filmmaking they all have a different idea about how to do about. filmmaking yes. so although you can talk to them about it you can argue a lot more or disagree everyone's got a sep- i could take two of my friends of equal experience and they would provide completely different criticisms of the same thing yeah one would find one more thing mm-hmm. a bit more important than the other the other one might not even 
notice it as a problem because they think it's fine the way it is. And uh, funny enough that you mentioned fine art. Um, yeah, I'm I'm of the belief that anything that's created in a way can be called art. Yes, but there's agreed. there's a there's a way that uh, some people's minds work. You know, there's art. Everything's art, but there is a form of art that if you take it from a film standpoint, if you were to call it art. It, it's like not telling a normal story. It's presented in a really artistic way. Like, just look at the kind of things that come out of the Edinburgh College of Art. Right, yeah. Some of them, it might not be a fully telling, flowing story, but it's something done with weird visuals that yes. is symbolic and mm-hmm. uh, blah, 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 blah. And I think that that's one of the things that, uh, as a filmmaker, I'm trying to push against. Yes. Pretentious. Like, well, aspects, yeah, maybe. some Would of it's pretentious, pretentious, although I don't think they're even intending it to be that way. Mm, yeah. But <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that are complaining about the state of Hollywood or the state of the film industry, mm. and they're saying, how come I can't get, like, how come I can't get this gig to be a filmmaker, or how come this yeah. guy gets pushed and I don't? And it's because they're playing their cards far too early. Mm. They're trying to make this, like, really visually artistic mm-hmm. and really weird symbol at the end of the day it's the kind of thing that people of their kind of mind frame can watch mm-hmm. not, like I'm sorry I, I like watching that kind of stuff yeah. but if you were to put that on prime time television at night on channel yes. 4 the majority of viewers probably wouldn't sit through it yeah I mean people people have a very strange relationship with uh, maybe I don't want to say success sometimes the things that other people do can appear to be worse than they are based on how popular they are and it's I also yeah I, I i don't know if what you mean by what you were saying was that people uh, their their reach out, out sta- uh, um it doesn't extend to their grasp if that makes any sense i've really messed that quotation up but they want to make their zombie epic or whatever it is but they just don't have the equipment the know how the experience to do so and so yeah, they some shot people their try to make a so sci-fi movie yeah. on like a shoestring uh-huh. budget and it was that sci-fi movie that it maybe if they had continued to increase the amount of equipment that they had over time, you know, incrementally get a new thing here, get a new thing there and build up what they had and also build up what they had up here in their head okay. and, and their experience of making films or making anything. Well, the experience that that is the key word. off way more successfully. You know? Experience is the key word. I'm not saying that making these kind of flashy artistic films isn't talented. Not at all. I mean, um, I probably couldn't make one, mm. but if I if I was running a company, I wouldn't hire somebody that's made one of them to to tell a story in a normal film because they haven't displayed storytelling. Yes. They've, what they've done is they've displayed their own intelligence or how. I, I hate saying that because I feel like yeah. I don't want I don't want to offend anyone that mm. listens to this that maybe does that kind of stuff, but. To me, it seems more like you're trying to show off how clever and creative you are instead of showing that you can tell a story that will yes. engage the audience, which... Yeah, and that's a strange thing You kind of need, art. if you yeah. want to make it, you've mm-hmm. got to be able to tell a story. You can't just be able to say, look how creative I am. Mm-hmm. Creative doesn't mean that much. Mm-hmm. Well, we're, we're supposed to be storytellers. Yeah. Maybe sometimes it maybe comes off as visual photography. It's, it, it's, it comes across. You know, it's like that makes any sense. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's it's too. It's very esoteric. It's very esoteric. Yeah. yeah, you've got so many people that are going against the grain, trying to uh, trying to be mm-hmm. so defined as individuals and anti. Is that like we're being anti Hollywood, anti establishment and stuff? Then they have the audacity to complain that they're not getting any work in mm-hmm. the industry. Of course you're not getting any yeah. work in the industry. You're trying your hardest to go against the industry. You can't have your cake and eat it. You yes. have to. You know, I've I've talked to this with uh, my friend Mike Flick. Um, if you want to play that card, play it after you've became successful. Yes. If you want, if you want to, like Martin Scorsese, um, went against it, and he became successful. But that was back in the like everyone was doing it yeah. back then. It it was new. Mm-hmm. It's not new anymore. There's a whole group of people going against the establishment these days. Yes. That you're no longer clever or individual mm. to do so. If you want to make things that are at an establishment, you've got to wait until you've got an audience mm-hmm. and you like at least a mainstream audience mm-hmm. that you can teach because so far these kind of people they're creating things that the people that they're shown to are the exact same and they already get what they're talking about. Yeah. 
they already understand the anti-establishment thing. Now, yeah. I, I also want to confirm, I'm not saying that all people that make this stuff are anti-establishment. No, Some people all. are genuine artists yeah. and creatives. Yeah. But uh, I, I do see a lot of people that want jobs yeah. in the industry, but they specifically uh-huh. design their work against exactly. the industry. Exactly. I think a long story short, it's it's a conversation that you could spend years having because mm. it's such a you know it's 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 like the the glass ha- is half empty or half full is it you could have two philosophers just sit in a room for five years you know <laughs> smoking shisha thinking about that that question is it half empty or is it half full i mean yes yeah, it's, it's you get bogged down in the minutia of art very quickly and i think that's what turns some people off from the more artistic stuff which might have something to do with with the the the, the common denominator in cinema maybe people want it to be straightforward when are the Transformers coming on the screen? I want to see the transform. Where are the tits and explosions, Michael Bay? I want to see the boobs and the explosions. That's what I want. Oh, and, those films you know, were it's, terrible. I, I don't know. In terms of industry-wise, uh, as someone that makes films, I mean, where do you see Hollywood going over the next 20 years? What's going to happen at Hollywood? Because for every good film that's produced by Hollywood, there are uh, quite a few that are that are... It's not that they're bad films, it's that they're not offering anything new to the audience. They're art money-making machines. I wonder if That's Hollywood's going to have a crash are. because of the amount of movement of capital and creative people that are moving out of it. But although there's still a ton there, but I wonder how much longer Hollywood will survive. I mean, when they started making cars in China, Detroit was pretty much fucked. <laughs> and I wonder what's going to happen to Hollywood. Will they be the Detroit of filmmaking in 50 years? Well, Hollywood's already starting to go on somewhat of a decline. I mean, with the, with the advancements made in the digital age, Age, you mentioned it there a lot of people are veering away from Hollywood because they can create their visions with full creative control yeah. they don't have to worry about the entry producers. level capital yeah. investment from the person that's making it is so much lower than it used to be yeah, yeah you but you've got people that are or a already yeah. working in Hollywood leaving you've got people like um, Spike Lee or I believe even Spielberg did it for Lincoln they were able to raise funds completely independently in order to make something and then it gets picked up by studios so that during the creative process they've not got producers yes. like dipping their finger in the pie to get things shifted around uh-huh. in their own way I think that eventually this will probably happen and um, the only people that will remain in Hollywood are the ones that want to make money I, I have a feeling that if mm. I was to go over Hollywood at the moment I'd probably be overwhelmed by the amount of business like um, uh, Mario Van Peebles once said that um, film is ninety nine percent business and one percent films. Yes, which is is sad. That, you inject that, enough money and value into an industry, and it would be corrupted fantastically yeah. quickly. <laughs> it's anything. But I also don't think know. this is anything new. Think of all the films that you remember from mm-hmm. the past. You're only remembering the ones that were successful there yes. must have been hundreds of thousands of films that nobody remembers mm-hmm. and they don't remember them five years later you get that with music rather dep- depressingly something that you thought was great five years ago even just five years ago and you listen to it you go this is really not held up you know because you listen to it you're like oh, there's, there's nothing about this that's really exceptional and i think films that receive like it got a positive review you'll read that it's negative largely critically panned or yui bold is my favorite director in that respect you know Uva. Yui, uh, Uva Ball. Uva, is it Uva? Uva the Ball. German guy that makes video game movies. Yeah. And they're all fucking terrible. Yeah. He's, he's, started, <laughs> he's, to, he's, he's great. started to make movies that are they're they're not great, but he's <laughs> uh, um well, all right, let's let's educate you a little bit on Uva Ball. Tell me mm. right, I'll I'll name the first two things. Please, Did you hear please, about the German yeah. tax loophole that Uva Ball used? It's I didn't not the tax loophole I was under the impression that the German government were giving out grant money for making films for a long time and so a lot of really bad films were made on on state money it's (laughs) it's, it's kind of like that it's the exact plot of the producers Mm mm-hmm if Uva Bowl's movies performed really badly, yeah. there would be a tax loophole that would allow them to make their money back by just not paying tax on the bad there movie. There you go. Oh, um, it's um, <laughs> it's uh, it was what was known as Nazi gold. So right, um, okay. But however, that's now illegal to right. exploit that, and he was exploiting it. Mm-hmm. So now he's started making half decent movies. Mm-hmm. So you didn't know that about him, no? I didn't know that about. Do you know much more about Uwe Ball? I could. Uh, did you hear about the crit- the thing he did with the critics? I, I I had heard that there was a one million strong petition for him to retire. 
the people people signed a, a petition it, the, the target was a million they got to a million saying Huey Ball please retire because you make awful films and he was like I'm hearing you guys but I've decided not to retire I'm just going to continue um, <laughs> House of the Dead I've seen House of the Dead my fucking god please look it up on YouTube there's uh, a video where he talks about how he has set up a Pro Bowl um, campaign so that people could um, uh, so that people could mm, say that I want you to continue and he just says he, he sets himself off on a tangent I'm not very good at doing a German accent but yeah, he's like yeah. him, I've set up a Pro Bowl <laughs> yeah. the fuck that's not bad, that's not bad. That. he's like I've, I've yeah. set up a Pro, pro Bowl then he just suddenly spouts off and goes, look, I'm not a fucking retard, you know? I know what I'm fucking doing. I'm not making this same Michael Bay, George Clooney political bullshit because I'm the only fucking genius in this entire industry. <laughs> he goes off Yeah, the level that. of ego. Like, I find ego entertaining in a lot of people. Like, you know, you hear you go, you're like, this is great. I love listening to this. Now, how's this, this for great. ego? Though? You didn't hear about what he did with the critics, no? No. He challenged his harshest critics to a boxing match. Right. Yes. Literally. Literally. Right. You can find it on YouTube. So he picked, uh, I think, five of his harshest critics, and um, he would just say, "You talk about how you want to kill me, and you're a son of a bitch, and stop making films." He said, "Get into a ring with me, and we'll have it out." <laughs> yeah. And um, they did. And Uva Bowl's an ex boxer. Right. Yeah. And he fucking hammered them. <laughs> sorry. Wait. He actually. Sorry. So he actually had the boxing match. He, with all five critics at the same time or just no it was separately yeah, yeah. he got in a ring he gave them yeah. like three or so months oh. to train and he got in the ring and he hammered them he slaughtered every one of his critics Ooh, we blood bowl so we should have called it <laughs> Jesus that. oh but he shot himself in the foot because um, uh, if they were to get defeated by him they had to say on camera that they liked Uva Bowl movies and uh, he shot himself in the foot because he didn't realise the double meaning of the phrase he he'd said you see, people get hit in the heads, they like my movies. <laughs>